time to get into it and familiarize yourself with his research. We are going to discuss some of Graham's earlier work later in the program, such as Fingerprints of the Gods and Talisman, but we are going to begin to talk about his latest book, Entangled, a uh, novel actually, and I'm uh, curious to know why Graham has chosen to take this route considering his uh, past and uh, excellent non-fictional work. Entangled carries a message, though, that can be found in, for instance, Supernatural. Uh, it's a tale of two women from two different times, uh, destined to battle the forces of evil. Uh, it's the first book in a three-part series, and uh, this is what we are going to talk more about here today. The website is simply grahamhancock.com. Go there for more information about the latest book, Entangled, his previous works, and tons of other stuff. His uh, website, uh, including with his forum, is an excellent resource of exciting knowledge and research. Welcome to Red Eyes Radio, Graham. Thank you for joining us. We are really excited to have you with us today. Thank you, Henrik. It's a pleasure to be with you as well. Very nice to talk to you. So well, tell us first a little bit about uh, this decision of yours, Graham, to go into the uh, area of novels. Uh, have you shied away from doing non-fictional work now, or wh why? <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't. But um, I've, been, I've been working um, as a, as a non-fiction author, um, actually for almost 30 years now. My first uh, book that I ever wrote was a travel book called Journey Through Pakistan, which was published back in 1981. And uh, so I'm coming up for close to 30 years uh, of writing documentary uh, factual books. And it wasn't until the late 1980s 1988-89 that I really began to work on a book that concerned a historical mystery and that was The Sign and the Seal, a, a quest for the lost Ark of the Covenant. It was, if you like, my initiation uh, into the realm of mystery and of what is hidden from us uh, in our past. And I went on from there, and we'll talk about these later, uh, to write books like Fingerprints of the Gods, uh, and, um, uh, for example, Keeper of Genesis and Heaven's Mirror uh, and Underworld, which investigate the possibility that there may have been a huge forgotten episode in human history, a lost civilization, you know, by, by, by any other name, dating back, I believe, more than 12,000 years. So I really put my life on the line to create these books. I mean, Underworld, for example, involved six years of intensive uh, scuba diving uh, all around the world, down to depths uh, of 40 meters um, in sometimes very severe currents, uh, following up sightings and rumors of ruins submerged beneath the sea uh, by rising sea levels at the end of the last ice age. So this was a very in a very in-depth research, and really after I had completed uh, Underworld, which followed long after Fingerprints of the Gods, I felt that in terms of the story, in terms of the investigation into a lost civilization, I had taken the work as far as I could go, and that there was a danger if I continued that I would become one of those authors who simply repeat themselves with every book. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I didn't want that to happen to me. For me, the lifeblood of writing is to be fresh and new and to be working at the cutting edge uh, rather than, than uh, way back in the, in the rear guard. And, and, and so I felt very strongly that it was time uh, for me to move on. And I wasn't clear exactly where I wanted to go. I had one more nonfiction project that I really wanted to do, and this was the book that became Supernatural, mm -hmm. which is a, quite a departure from my previous Lost Civilization work and, and looks at um, shamanism and altered states of consciousness uh, and the notion that, that, that shamans, as Terence McKenna put it, may have kept the flames of a tremendous mystery burning, which our scientists have ignored, uh, that there may be a, a secret doorway that we can open inside our minds and, and project our consciousness through into other freestanding realms and dimensions inhabited by intelligent beings. Well, the shamans call them spirits, and we call them other things in Western society. Mm. But this is the notion. And, and, and so that was, again, that book was published in 2005, and that was another big 
detailed, factual investigation into mystery, you know, with a thousand plus footnotes and huge amounts of references. Uh, I, I, I hope it's a, a stimulating and controversial book, but it's also, you know, a very detailed, thoroughly researched book. Mm. Now, while I was writing, sorry, this is a very long preamble, but while I was writing and researching Supernatural, I had extraordinary experiences with uh, what is called the vine of the dead or the vine of souls. This is the shamanistic brew called ayahuasca Mm -hmm. that shamans drink in the Amazon. Um, And it plunges them into a deeply altered state of consciousness and onward from there into absolutely convincing parallel worlds. And in order to write about the shamanistic experience, I felt I needed to have that experience myself um, and began to drink uh, ayahuasca. Uh, I found it, I went to the Amazon, I sat down with the shamans, I learned from them, I drank the brew many, many times, and I've continued to drink it since the research on Supernatural. And back in 2006, at a series of sessions in Brazil, I set myself an intention. And this is often what we do with ayahuasca. When you're entering the spirit realm, you need to have an intention. Mm -hmm. And my intention was... I want to expand myself creatively. I want to try and explore some extraordinary ideas through the vehicle of fiction, through a novel. Mother Ayahuasca, can you give me a vision that will help me to see where I go? And I was given the most extraordinary series of visions over five sessions of ayahuasca in Brazil which set me on the path that led to the writing of this novel. I was shown the essential element of the story, that there are two young women, one in the Stone Age, one today, and that they are entangled with one another in the the quantum physics sense, that they're brought together to do battle with a demon who's traveling through time, that they must cooperate and work together to defeat this demonic force. It must be defeated both in the Stone Age and today in the 21st century in order to drive it away. And this was the heart of the story, and I saw many individual scenes, but more than that, it was as though I had downloaded from the spirit world Mm. uh, an entire novel. And the process of writing it was really a process of rediscovering that download. Huh. So there's a very long answer to your very short question. <laughs> well, that's really interesting. And, and I also want to ask you, obviously, how, you know, obviously you've chosen till, still to be within the realm of your research, so to speak, but you keep yes. it in a novel form now. And um, do you think that, the, have you gone down this route to target another audience as well? Maybe not target the, the, the regular, you know, choir, as it were, maybe who mm-hmm. are reading your mm-hmm. books and are critical of your work and, and mm-hmm. want to try to di- dissect it. This takes you into another area where you can be more free, so to speak. Maybe. Yes, there's great freedom with fiction and particularly with fantasy. And this, this novel is very much in the genre of uh, fantasy adventure. Um, there's great freedom there because um, uh, with my non-fiction work, the the academic critics and i have many of them in fact it seems that i have a devoted group (laughs) of academic critics who follow everything i do and and um really i wonder sometimes if they're paid a salary to do this because they seem to have so much time um and investigate minutely every statement that i make and if if they can find any weakness or any doubt at all um, over the statement, this is then elaborated and expanded out into a devastating critique, not only of my work, but also of me as a human being. And I am I'm just utterly uh, dismissed as a, as, as, as a human being that one should not even consider uh, thinking about. This is the academic uh, reaction to me. Well, what's great about fantasy uh, and fiction uh, is that, uh, they, that, that, they, that they really cannot usefully throw those criticisms at me anymore because the reaction is simply, hey guys, relax. It's just fiction, mm. you know? Mm. It's just fantasy. Chill. Um, but what I found is that in the realm of fantasy, it, for this very reason, it makes it possible to us, for us to explore uh, extraordinarily interesting ideas that honestly simply could not be touched uh, if they were being presented as nonfiction. Um, somehow our society is not ready, uh, I have learned, for the exploration of certain mysteries 
um, if those mysteries are presented as being possible facts. Rather, we are ready to explore mysteries with our imagination, but we prefer not to be told that they are facts at the moment. It's as though putting the material into a fictional format gives us permission uh, somehow from our society to look at things that we otherwise wouldn't have looked at. And, and for me, that's a great uh, creative uh, opportunity. You see, what I found with my, with my non-fiction books as this process of, of corrosive academic attack continued, and I, I should say, I'm, I'm not against academics attacking me. This is a good thing that they do. It's a service. It requires me to up my game. It right. requires me to make sure that what I'm doing is the best standard it can possibly be. It's a kind of quality control mechanism, sometimes maybe motivated by, by, by personal or negative motives on the part of the individual concerned, but nevertheless, it requires me to address it and pay attention to it and adjust my work accordingly. And, and what I discovered as the years went by and as the academic criticism became more and more personal in, and intense was that I was... Um, you could almost say trying to bulletproof my arguments before I put them out there. And the result of this was that, so, so I would support every statement with lots and lots of references and footnotes and repeat the facts and the details and the evidence so that people really got it. Mm. The result, however, and so that my critics wouldn't have that little angle to come in and say, oh, this is wrong, so everything in Hancock's work is wrong, as they repeatedly do. But the result of that process, and you can see it clearly in my book, uh, Underworld, which is around about 800 pages long, was that I ended up writing at enormous length. And uh, I fear that I was becoming increasingly boring by trying to um, by trying to respond to the academic environment, it made the the lively and adventurous spirit that was at the heart of my work in Fingerprints of the Gods. It made it impossible to maintain that spirit by the time I got to Underworld in 2002. Um, and and I felt very strongly as a writer, I don't want to go on writing in this defensive mode. Uh, I want to be on the attack. That's my role. That's my job. That's what I'm here to do. I don't want to be defending myself in advance for, against anticipated arguments. And I, and I suddenly realized, hey, it's very straightforward. Fiction is the way to go. I can work in the same realm of ideas, but I, can, I need not be defensive because I'm not saying this is fact. I'm saying this is a story. Enjoy. <laughs> so what is some of the reality behind the story then? I mean, with a, for instance, with a uh, demon army named Illimani, you know, in, yeah. in Entangled, uh, what, what level of uh, your previous work have you chosen to incorporate into this, so to speak? Well, when I was uh, researching uh, Supernatural, um, really what set that book off, my last nonfiction book, what set that off um, was a mystery uh, in the human story. And the mystery is this, that, that until about 40,000 years ago, there is no evidence that our ancestors, even though they were anatomically modern and looked exactly like you and I, there was no uh, evidence at all that, uh, that they were what we would recognize as human. Their behavior um, was com almost unrecognizable as human behavior. There was no uh, symbolism, no evidence of lateral thinking, no creativity, no sense of um, a world beyond this material world. Um, these seem to be totally material creatures rooted and grounded in the daily struggle of life. And then suddenly, somewhere around 40,000 years ago, that's four zero thousand years ago, it's as though a light is switched on in the human brain uh, all over the world, pretty much at once. And you suddenly get this amazing phenomenon that is called cave art and rock art. Our ancestors begin painting scenes on cave and rock walls all around the world. And these scenes are not observations of everyday life, by and large. If you really get into them closely, you find that they are filled with fantastical elements and that there are strange beings and creatures depicted in the scenes, um, for which the technical term is therianthrope. That's from the Greek uh, therion, meaning wild beast, and anthropos meaning man. These are beast men, part animal, part human, depicted in the moment of transformation from one uh, to the other. And this, of course, is the classic imagery of shamanism, 
we can find shamans uh, in the Amazon today uh, after drinking ayahuasca when they return to normal consciousness they too paint their visions just as our ancestors did tens of thousands of years ago and these paintings uh, depict uh, identical beings to the beings that are seen in the very ancient uh, cave art hmm. Um, so I began to realize that this was an extraordinarily important moment in human history. And, and uh, yeah, I did very much want to set part of my novel in the Stone Age. I didn't want to set the whole novel in the Stone Age because I, I wanted the story to, to travel in time, to move across time, to jump between two different times. But I thought this is uh, an enormously interesting period when really it seems that there was a struggle uh, for the soul of mankind. And for a while, it seemed that the creative side of ourselves, the beautiful side of ourselves, came out and expressed itself in this art. And then it, and then it disappeared again for a long time. And, and I, so I supposed I, I, I projected the notion of, a, of an evil force, a demonic force. He's called Sulpa uh, in the novel. And uh, he leads a tribe uh, called the Illimani. And in fact, they, um, he has, uh, he's a demon who has taken a human body. And um, what he wants to do, what he needs to do, he's taken a human body in the Stone Age, and his project is to manifest or materialize physically in the 21st century. And to gain power to do this, uh, his project is to massacre innocents wherever he finds it. And the most innocent, uh, the most beautiful humans in the world at that time, in the time my story is set 24,000 years ago, are not anatomically modern humans like you and I. They're the Neanderthal, mm -hmm. who we meet early on in the story, although my main character, Rhea, is an anatomically modern human being. She's interacting with the Neanderthals, who, 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 are, who they call the uglies in the story. Um, and, and she's caught up with them for a reason, because this de demonic force, Sulpa, what he's really seeking to do is to massacre and kill off the Neanderthals uh, in the most horrible way possible. Because they are pure goodness, uh, he will gain enormous psychic power from doing that. And so the novel becomes, um, a, in a sense, a, a struggle to prevent the extinction of the Neanderthals by anatomically modern humans. And of course, this is a debate that goes on to this day. Mm -hmm. Were the Neanderthals wiped out by anatomically modern humans, or did they die for some, reason, some other reason? And it becomes a very important issue in the story that the Neanderthals must not be wiped out by anatomical human beings. Because if that happens, if the demon Sulpa has his victory in that respect, then that means he's here with us in the 21st century as well. Uh, and so it must be presented, as you can see, prevented. As you can see, there's a very different notion of the character of time uh, in this novel uh, than most of us work with, that time is not an arrow, that it doesn't flow simply from past through present to future, mm. that perhaps all times in different realms coexist simultaneously like parallel worlds, uh, that certain times are interlinked and connected, and that when they are, uh, enormous potential for good and for evil uh, is unleashed. So do you think that, I mean, this it sounds also a little bit like a, it's an apocalyptic theme here, obviously, and, and it has to do with, the, the, the again, the, the cyclical nature of, of time, that you, you tie in the beginning, so to speak, and I, now then potentially we can say that we're at the, at the end of this cycle as well, and, yes. and, and this is just how the story kind of ties together, I guess. There is indeed an, 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 an apocalyptic uh, uh, theme uh, to, this, uh, to, to this story, and of course, as you know, the book uh, Entangled that you have in your hands is the first book of a series of books uh, which will uh, explore um, this adventure uh, much, much further. But, but uh, I won't be giving too much away if I say that it does uh, ultimately uh, bring us close uh, to apocalyptic events in our time uh, and that it is, uh, it is essential to prevent those events in our time, to prevent them reaching the horrible state that they might reach, to put things right uh, in the past, and mm -hmm. that is what these two characters are doing. So the different view of time is that you can readjust the past, and it is uh, that project which the novel is all about, really, uh, about a fight of good. It's a battle of good against evil, um, and, and uh, the, the, the evil force has, has a particular aim, 
which must be frustrated if he is not to, pl- to, to destroy all of human potential forever. That is the, that is the jeopardy. That's what's at stake here. Uh, I'm also reminded of the uh, when you did your television series uh, back with, I think it was Channel 4, mm. uh, you showed this beautiful depiction uh, at Anchor Wat of, of the, these two armies, so to speak, that are churning the, the Milky Way. The Milky the, Ocean, yes. The Milky Ocean. And, and it, it is on that theme, isn't it? It's the same story in one way that you're telling Well, I suppose so, because that's a demonic and a, a, an army of demons and uh, and angels um, con- confronting one another. Um, where I took it, uh, I suppose where I take it further in in Entangled um, is the notion. You see, the, the the force of good cannot interfere directly in human affairs. It can only work through human consciousness, and that's why these two young women, the heroes of the story, are so important. There is an angel, the blue angel who is locked in this cosmic battle with the demonic force, Sulpa. But in order to succeed in that battle, she cannot defeat Sulpa directly on the human plane. That has to be done by human beings. It's our, uh, ultimately, there's a philosophical point behind this, that, that we as human beings have a special predicament, different from all other life on this planet. And that is that we have the power to recognize and to choose between good and evil. That it's our responsibility. The matter is not out of our hands. It's totally in our hands. And in this novel, I place it in the hands of two vulnerable but courageous young women uh, who make that choice, who make the choice for good and set themselves against the evil uh, in both time frames to save humanity from, you know, from, from, from a terrible cataclysm. And you also have a little bit of the story in terms of, uh, uh, I guess, the use of, of, of drugs as well as, as an entry very much, point. Very much so. Very much so. And this, of course, is, <coughs> is bound to be seen <coughs> as, a, as a controversial uh, aspect uh, of Entangled. I would say this is perhaps the world's first DMT novel <laughs> or ayahuasca novel uh, as well or psilocybin novel because both because the dimethyltryptamine in its uh, pure form uh, dimethyltryptamine uh, in its place within the ayahuasca uh, beverage and psilocybin mushrooms uh, all feature strongly uh, in this story and the reason they feature strongly in this story. Well, first and foremost, of course, my own background research in supernatural into shamanism uh, all around the world. It's a fact. Of course, there are other techniques for getting into altered states of consciousness. Rhythmic dancing for very long periods of time, 40 days of uh, fasting, even certain kinds of austerities and, 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 and pain, as in the Native American sun dance, will put you into an altered state of consciousness where Uh, spirit realms become accessible. But for the, still, the majority of shamans in the majority of tribal and hunter-gatherer societies that survive in the world today, the main mechanism that they use for entering parallel realms uh, is indeed uh, uh, visionary plants, which we call, of course, hallucinogens uh, in our society. And our society has uh, been brainwashing us with propaganda for more than 40 years now propaganda that emerges from very specific material interests on the part of specific groups, mainly in American society. And this propaganda is called the war on drugs. Uh, And it's rather like the war on witches in the 16th century. Mm. Uh, Adults who responsibly decide to explore their own consciousness, their own consciousness, not somebody else's, using sacred plants that have been In honorable use in human culture for more than 10,000 years, for sure, we have the archaeological evidence that adults who make that responsibility to explore in the inner sanctum of their own consciousness may yet in our society face the threat of being sent to prison for doing so. Hmm. To me, this is a modern witch hunt. It It is as irrational, as cold, as vicious, and as cruel as the persecution of witches in Europe in the 16th and 15th centuries and, and, and before. Hmm. And the damage it causes to our society, this so-called war on drugs, is equally great. It's not the drugs that cause the damage. It's the war on drugs 
that causes the damage. If we want adults to responsibly use drugs, we must provide them with information about drugs that tell the truth. And part of the problem is that government ca propaganda campaigns on drugs have lost all credibility, particularly with young people, and nobody uh, believes them anymore. I accept that some drugs are extremely harmful, but I do not agree that the way to prevent pe people taking them is to make them illegal and to subject those people to huge periods of time in prison. Right, right. The, the, the issue of tobacco, which of course is a highly addictive drug, has, uh, has shown us for sure that if you give people good information that they believe, and it's important they believe it, about the health risks of a particular herb, uh, they will stop using that herb. So there, without anybody ever being sent to prison, there's been a dramatic reduction in the number of tobacco smokers in the industrialized countries simply through the exercise of free choice mm. on the basis of good information. Of course, the opposite story is true with the illegal drugs, where there has been a huge increase in their consumption despite 40 years of persecution and, and uh, you know, very, um, very invasive uh, policies. So where I come from on this is that um, if I, as an adult, am not sovereign over my own consciousness, if I live in a society that does not allow me to have the keys to my own consciousness, then I can't claim to be free at all in any way. Yeah. And it's utterly pointless for me to talk uh, and, and, and admire the achievements of democracy in the West, where that very democracy is, for example, in the United States, arresting 700,000 people a year for smoking marijuana mm. and destroying their lives. Because once you are arrested for one of these so-called crimes, uh, you have a record which operates against you for the rest of your life. Mm. Do we really want to inflict that kind of misery on people? Can't we find a better way forward? Can't we actually learn the lesson of tobacco? And above all, can't we recognize that certain of these so-called drugs, and I speak particularly of the visionary plants here, uh, which are used in shamanistic cultures all around the world, that certain of these plants have an enormously constructive and positive role to play for the human creature, uh, a, a creative and nurturing role, not a deadly, dangerous, dark and awful role, but a very, very positive role. So, so I, I believe strongly that it is part of our birthrights as adults, and I emphasize as adults, this is not a matter for children. Sure. Um, it is part of our birthright to explore the consciousness that this amazing universe has given us. We must not be told what to do with our consciousness by the state. Mm -hmm. It is not the state's business what we do with our consciousness. It's our business alone. Only if a change in our consciousness then causes us to get into the face of other people and cause trouble to those other people, do I accept that the state has a role? But uh, to, 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 to put somebody in prison for exploring their own consciousness with sacred plants, to me that is a gross breach of human rights and it is morally repugnant uh, in every possible way. And I will remain a campaigner uh, on, on, on this matter for the rest of my days. I think fundamentally it is a human rights uh, issue. So yes, uh, Entangled, my novel, uh, does include um, quite a lot of information, quite a lot of scenes that involve DMT, dimethyltryptamine, that involve psilocybin. It's, it's psilocybin mushrooms that, the, that uh, the Stone Age characters use to enter parallel realms. And in the modern, the modern character, Leone, uh, she um, takes part uh, later in the story. Her first initiation is, is through a near-death experience, as you know. Mm. But she then takes part in a scientific project giving DMT to human volunteers, and this takes her further. And that, of course, is based on the work of Dr. Rick Strassman at the University of New Mexico. Uh, Rick, has, Rick is one of the few scientists who's been allowed to work with human volunteers and dimethyltryptamine. He did a six-year study at the University of New Mexico, and he reported his results in an amazing book called DMT, The Spirit Molecule. And the conclusion that this leading mainstream scientist comes to is, that it is really quite stunning because he found that all of his volunteers, although not comparing notes, were meeting the same entities in the same landscapes 
during their journeys on DMT. And normally, when we humans all see the same thing, we tend to agree that it's real. <laughs> and so he started to ask himself, could it be that these realms that my volunteers are going into with DMT, could it be that those are real also? Could we be dealing with the ultimate mystery of quantum physics here? Could this be a way for us to put our consciousness into parallel universes? And it's that very exciting idea that's, that's also at the heart of Entangled. Uh, and it's precisely why I use these sacred drugs as the vehicle to get my characters into and out of the parallel realms where they can actually meet out of body and interact uh, with one another. But I realize it's a controversial area. I know that there will be some knee-jerk uh, reactions uh, to this, but I think it's the role of the fiction writer to explore uh, controversial areas and throw them open for discussion. Absolutely. Uh, why do you think it, it is an important story to tell? I mean, again, if we go back to that idea that you mentioned that you uh, basically asked the uh, the spirit, if we can call it that, uh, for a story to tell, so to speak, and, okay. and this is what came forward. W mm. What do you think is the important elements here that uh, our uh, you know society or civilization today needs to hear that is contained within the story? I think the, I, for me, um, I hope um, that one of the most important elements of Entangled uh, is the mystery of consciousness, um, that we cannot be at all sure uh, that our consciousness is simply generated by our brains, the way that, uh, you know, a factory makes cars. That is the general view uh, of materialist scientists, and almost all scientists are ultimately reductionists and materialists at heart. They want to weigh, measure, and count things, and if they can't weigh, measure, and count it, then as far as many scientists are concerned, it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. But scientists are up against a, a problem with consciousness. In fact, they call it the big problem because they haven't really figured out what consciousness is. They don't really understand what it is. They know it's associated with the brain, for sure, in some way. Um, but they don't understand how this few pounds of jelly inside our skulls um, can, can transmute sensations of the outside world into inner experiences, emotions, feelings, thoughts. We really don't know how that works. It's not that scientists have, are beginning to get an idea. They actually don't have a bloody clue. They have no idea what consciousness is. And in the absence of facts, a number of scientists, Richard Dawkins, for example, the author of The God Delusion, the Orwellian title professor of the public understanding of science is his. Um, they uh, absolutely uh, believe and state as though it were a fact that consciousness is simply an epiphenomenon of the brain, that the brain is primarily there to, you know, to, to help us negotiate uh, this material world um, as, as sort of intelligent robots, and that our consciousness is just an accidental byproduct of that, and it's completely meaningless, actually. Um, in, in, in terms of the materialistic scientific framework. It is just produced by the brain, and they believe when the brain dies, our consciousness dies also. I absolutely oppose uh, this point of view. Mm. Firstly, because there is no evidence for it, and secondly, because it does not uh, accord uh, with my own experiences and the experiences of others concerning the mysterious nature of reality. And it's one of the reasons why I open the book pretty much, uh, with a near-death experience where the modern character in Los Angeles, Leone, uh, has taken uh, a drug overdose, in this case one of those prescription drugs called OxyContin that are abused in our society. Mm. She's taken a drug overdose, she's, di she's dead, and her, her consciousness doesn't die. It leaves her body and it travels through a tunnel of light uh, into a parallel world. Now that is not fantasy on my part, that is based on thousands and thousands of reports of what are called near-death experiences. I've just been reading recently a, a stunning report of a near-death experience that goes back as far as Plato. Mm. It's in Plato's Georgias, uh, and it tells the story of a soldier called Ur, who was killed on the battlefield. And three days later, just as they were about to put him on the funeral pyre, he jumped up. He, re he returned to life. And he had had the most incredible near-death experience, uh, which he describes in great uh, detail. 
And so what's interesting to me is that when people are actually flatlining on the ECG and are regarded as clinically dead, they are nevertheless continuing to have vivid experiences. And there are cases uh, on the record, the famous case of the tennis shoe, which I do allude to in one um, uh, scene uh, in uh, Entangled. A woman died in the operating theater in an American hospital. She was flatlined. They believed she was dead. They were struggling to recuperate her um, using um, electric shock to, 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 to jolt her back, back, back to life. And, mm. and during this period when she was regarded as clinically dead, her body left her, her, her soul, as it were, left her body, looked down on the situation in the operating theater, was later able to describe exactly certain details of the operating theater that she should not have seen. She rose up through three floors of the hospital, exited from a window, and on a window ledge around the corner from the window, she saw a tennis shoe lying there. And she described the tennis shoe in perfect detail, including a little bit of chewing gum stuck on the undersole and, um, and, and the color of the laces uh, afterwards when suddenly she came back to life in the operating theater. This suggests to me very strongly that our consciousness is not produced by our brains, that the brain rather is better understood as a transceiver or a receiver of consciousness, rather in the way that a television set receives a signal from a remote broadcasting station. You know, if we're sitting watching our television and we pick up a brick and throw it through the screen of the TV, the picture's going to go, of course. Mm. But we'd be totally wrong to say that we've destroyed the signal. Right. We haven't. We've just destroyed the local reception of the signal. The signal's still there. And that's the suggestion, really, that, that I have about consciousness and which runs all the way through this novel, uh, in, Entangled, is that our consciousness may indeed separate from our bodies and that once it's separate from the body, it is not tied to any particular time of place. It becomes free and it can move through both time uh, and space. And, and really, this notion of the non-locality of consciousness um, despite materialist scientists kicking up against it, is enormously gaining ground. Uh, and I, I do believe that it is going to be found to be, to be true. So we must not think, for example, when a person is on their deathbed and they're silent and they seem to be in a coma, we must not think that they cannot hear what we say or respond to us. Physically, they may not be able to respond, but I've come to realize that they are present with us in that room, mm. in their consciousness, and that we must take account of that. Consciousness is one of the greatest mysteries of science. So what do you think, uh, you know, happened in terms of, if we go back to that time again, when you, you talked about the, uh, basically the invention of, of, of cave art, when, when these people who were around, either if they were us or if they were the proto-human beings, the Neanderthals mm -hmm. or what have you, there's something that happened there that suddenly, kind of it's like consciousness entered into the the minds of, of those yeah. people at that at that time you know we we've it's why it's why i called the non-fiction book um supernatural it's why i gave it the subtitle uh, meetings with the ancient teachers of mankind mm. um I, I believe that that's the time having been locked in the material realm for hundreds of thousands millions of years of evolution you see you can trace the human story back quite far in terms of physical appearance um, it, it, the last common ancestor um, of the chimpanzee and of modern humans is dated to about six or seven million years ago. And you don't get anatomically modern humans until about 195,000 years ago. And they don't suddenly start to behave like humans uh, until 40,000 years ago or less. And at the same time they start to behave like humans, that's when we get evidence that they've been exposed to psychedelic plants. It's at that very moment. The connection is as clear as that. Mm. Uh, I mean, to borrow a line from Timothy Leary, I'm suggesting that our ancestors were literally turned on by psychedelics, that they, that they uh, expanded and opened our minds mm. and took us out of six million years of utter boredom <laughs> and plunged us into an exciting, 
creative, spirit-imbued new realm. This is the very time they start painting these strange perianthropic beings on the cave walls. That's the time they start burying their dead as well. And they start burying their dead with food and with water. When people do that, you know that they believe that some aspect of the individual does not die when the physical body dies, that some aspect of the individual continues. And I have to ask myself, where did they get this idea from all of a sudden? out of the blue. Could it be from the same place that they got the idea of creatures that are part animal and part human and that transform from one to another, which we know is the place in our heads that is opened by these entheogenic so-called psychedelic plants? And I came to the conclusion that, uh, that, that yes, it is. And actually, if you look at other periods of enormous creativity in the human story, for example, the 1960s, uh, you will find that psychedelics actually played an enormous uh, and constructive role. Some people are willing to speak about this, about the role that psychedelics have played in their lives. Steve Jobs, for example, the owner, the founder of Apple, um, has uh, stated a a absolutely that, L that his LSD experiences as a young man were fundamental in the burst of creativity that led to the creation of, uh, of, of Apple. And he and Wozniak would actually... Um, when they interviewed programmers, uh, one of the questions they asked them was, have you taken a psychedelic before? Because having taken a psychedelic for them was a good sign that this person would be a brilliant programmer. <laughs> um, in fact, it was almost like a job requirement at one point. And Wozniak and Jobs have both spoken out uh, openly and honestly about this. Likewise, amazingly, Francis Crick, yes, yes. The, who I've uh, you know, discussed it before, one of the two scientists who discovered the, the, the double helix structure of DNA, it emerged after his death, he had confided uh, in, in a friend that um, it wasn't, you know, the beer at the Eagle Pub in Cambridge where he and Watson used to go for a drink that gave him the inspiration for the double helix. It was a vision that he saw under the influence of LSD. So I think that these demonized, sadly attacked uh, plants, which our society has so turned itself against, may actually contain the seeds of salvation of our society today. We're in terrible trouble. It's obvious the industrialized world, the technological world, is in a complete mess. We don't know what on earth we're doing or why we're here or where we're going. Look at the violence, the ugliness, the evil. My book is about, is about a demonic battle of good against evil, and you can see that battle of good against evil unfolding in the 21st century yeah. as we speak in the worst possible ways. Never has there been a time when human beings have been more cruel or awful to each other on such a gigantic scale hmm. as we are today. And, and, and uh, you know, this is, this is very clear. Now, what, what is it? What's gone wrong with the Western world? When I sat down with shamans in the Amazon and asked them that very question, they said, it's extremely straightforward. The West has severed its connection with spirit. You have to reconnect with spirit uh, or you're doomed. Hmm. And this is the time we live in. We live in a time when, when the, the triumphs of science have persuaded many of us that there is no mystery left. And at the same time, when the dead hand of the old monotheistic religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, lie across the world, not as an influence for good, but as an evil force. Yep. When these, these mainstream religions, Christianity, Judaism, and, and Islam, have such a grip on the human imagination, that, they, that as they have done through the ages, that they can persuade people to kill in the name of that religion. It's not just Islam. Christianity did it for hundreds of years. Look at those terrible burnings at the stake that Christians inflicted on innocent people. Look at the horrors, uh, even now, that unfold uh, within the, the secret kitchen of the Catholic Church. Mm. You know, these big religions, I have to say, I'm sorry, I may offend some of your listeners, but these big religions are not nurturing us spiritually. Nope. I believe they are misleading us spiritually. And what the shamans in the Amazon say, it's desperately important that we connect, that we reconnect to the realm of spirit and that we do so sooner rather than later because we will plunge the whole world down with us uh, if we do not. And, and for the shamans in the Amazon, it really is quite a, a, a simple answer. Uh, and that is, we need ayahuasca. 
<laughs> you know, and, and actually, I agree with them. I would say that that anybody who stands for the job of president of the United States or prime minister of this or that country, I would say that anybody who stands for that job, and I don't mean to be facetious here, that that person should have a requirement to have logged at least a dozen sessions of ayahuasca first, <laughs> because. Because if that person has logged a dozen sessions of ayahuasca, they will not be quite so sure about their prejudices, not quite so certain about their cruel instincts. They will begin to have some doubts about their course in life, and those doubts will be very helpful for all of us. Is it, is it a, a basic story again of, of, of knowledge versus ignorance and, and where our society has ended up, so to speak, is, is in the, on the side of, of ignorance, do you think? I think it's. I think yes. Um, in, in in fact, it's it's interesting that that many of the ancient texts um, equate uh, ignorance with uh, with evil. I'm not speaking of ignorance of book learning here. Sure, sure. I'm speaking of ignorance of the fundamental nature of things. Um, and 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 we are brainwashed to believe that our function as living creatures in modern society, we're brainwashed to believe that our function is primarily about show, about appearance about consumption, how, how much do we consume, how conspicuously do we consume it. We define ourselves in terms of material goods and products. Um, we do not define ourselves in terms of our inner landscape. Many of us have been persuaded that either uh, it's a matter of simple blind faith in the dogma of one of the three monotheistic r religions, in order to secure our afterlife destiny, or else people have been persuaded that there is no afterlife destiny, that nothing happens, that we're just lumps of meat, and when we're dead, we're dead, and that's the end of it. Neither of these two positions are, 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 are facts. What the ancient texts all tell us, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, the ancient Egyptian Book of the Dead, for example, is that when we die, our consciousness does continue, and that it must make a journey after death, and that we must account for everything we've done with this life uh, when we undertake that journey, that we will indeed be called to account. And it's often symbolized as a set of scales in ancient Egypt in which the heart r r is weighed against the feather of truth and cosmic justice. And the fundamental, there's many, many issues in this, in this judgment. One of them, it's necessary but not sufficient, is being a good person, being a wicked, cruel person um, inflicting violence and misery on others will always lead you to real problems in your afterlife journey. Mm. But being a good person is not enough. You must do something with this precious gift you were given of a human body and a human brain, the ability to choose between good and evil, the ability to use your consciousness to explore mysteries. The message seems to be, don't waste that gift that you were given. You were given it for a reason, to develop yourself as an eternal being, not to set yourself back. You were put into this life to learn and to grow and to develop. Did you use that gift well? Mm. That also seems to be the message, and it's a message which our society today never gives us, and it's a question that our society never asks. In fact, I would go so far as to say that Western technological society uh, is a vast, sophisticated device for sending the huge majority of humanity to sleep, yes. for keeping us in a state of un consciousness. So, see, th this goes back to those demonic forces, basically, that you mentioned b before as well. The, this idea of being fearful of death uh, and, and in, in the extension of that is basically that keeps humanity weak uh, and, and that serves a purpose in, in our hierarchy, uh, in, mm, in the system mm. of control. And, yes, you know, our, our, you're right. Uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, our hierarchy does seek to control death as well and to set certain definitions uh, for it. Um, uh, it, it, is, it is part of the mechanism of control that the whole attitude of the population to death should be structured uh, in, a, in a certain way. Um, the, simple, the simple message, I guess, that, that I would like to get across and that I have tried to get across um, in between the lines of the adventure story uh, in, uh, in, in Entangled is that uh, death may not be the end. Uh, it could be the beginning uh, of the next great adventure. And like any great adventure, uh, if we're going to go into it, we should be as well prepared as possible. We should equip ourselves with knowledge about this subject. And the only people in the world today who really have true and profound knowledge of the mystery of death are not scientists 
in Western technological societies. They're the shamans in hunter-gatherer and tribal societies still surviving all around the world. And um, if their advice is not enough for us, we may go back to the ancient texts. I mentioned the ancient Egyptian Book of the Dead. Uh, I mentioned uh, the Egyptian, uh, the, 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 the Tibetan mm. uh, Book of the Dead. Uh, we, may, we may go back and learn also from them about this great mystery that awaits us all. Because, you know, the ancient Egyptians and, uh, they, they, and, and the Tibetans, the ancient Egyptians devoted their best minds, you know, for 3,000 years to exploring that mystery, what happens to us when we die. Our society, of course, we devote our best minds to making new kinds of cars and washing machines and airplanes. Um, I know who I'd rather listen to. <laughs> and not even that anymore. I mean, look at the progress of things, the, the so-called progress. We're still driving around with the combustion engine and things like that. You think yeah. that we'd be way more ahead at this uh, stage? Uh, of you know, course, <laughs> except we're locked in by particular interest groups. Yes. Of course, yes. Demonic uh, forces, if you'd like. And, and, and again, that's why, that's why the battle of good and evil and, and the presence of a demon is, is, uh, you know, is an important part of the story uh, in, in Entangled. The, you, you, I'm sure you know the, the Gnostic um, texts and the Hermetic texts, which go back to the end of ancient Egypt and the, begin, and the time of the beginning of Christianity. And there's a, there's a particular Hermetic text <laughs> attributed to the god Hermes, uh, who was um, the Greek form of the ancient Egyptian wisdom god, Thoth. And he kind of makes a prophecy, uh, projecting forward into the future, looking really to, to our time. And he speaks of a time when the gods will have departed from the earth. And, and only, he says, evil angels will remain, mingling with mankind and, and driving the poor wretches to all manner of crimes and horror. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's uh, that's our society today, agitated by evil angels, uncertain of who we are, uh, and yet within all of us a yearning, a hope, uh, a sense that things can be made better, that some kind of transformation of consciousness may just be underway. When these things happen, they can happen very very fast. And 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 so I suppose my my overall position on this is one not of hopelessness, but of hope. I believe in the human spirit. Uh, I, 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 I'm confident if we can take, again, control of our own consciousness rather than handing the keys of it to others, we can still make the world better. All right. Uh, Graham is behind such books as uh, The Sign and the Seal, uh, Underworld, Talisman, Fingerprints of the Gods, just to, to mention a few there. But Graham, to, to uh, run things up for this first segment here, tell our listeners how to uh, first of all, get to your website, of course, to check out more sources yeah. there, but also how do they pick up a copy of your latest book? And tell okay. Them. Well, uh, the website is, is grahamhancock.com, G-R-A-H-A-M-H-A-N-C-O-C-K.com, and when you go into www.grahamhancock.com, right on the entry page, there's a button that will take you straight to material on Entangled, uh, or you can enter the main site. It's all in the main site uh, anyway. Um, and uh, in, terms of, in terms of buying Entangled, at the moment, it's only published in Britain, um, and it's available on Amazon.co.uk. Uh, we have the links up on my website. Um, and it will be published uh, in the US uh, in October, uh, and, the, and also in translation in Italy and a number of other countries uh, in October. But right now, it's only the UK edition that we have uh, out there, but... Um, you know, it's, it's available on uh, Amazon UK right now. Excellent. GrahamHancock.com, that is the main website. Again, stay with us, Graham, and we'll be right back with more after this.
That's our first hour with Graham Hancock, and we've only just scraped the surface, really. We are going to proceed talking with Graham in hour two for our members. And uh, we have so much more to talk about in terms of supernatural, entangled, and also fingerprints of the gods and talisman. We begin to talk about the end and the cyclical nature of civilization, and how fragile Western society is with its specialization and a level of general intelligence that seems to be going down and not up. We talk about inventions of a mind induced by so-called vision drugs and uh, various theories on when man first came into contact with the uh, psilocybin, mushrooms, Amanita muscara, and soma, plants and substances that might have helped to spark the mind of ancient man. We carry the discussion over to the preservation of shamanic tradition and gnosis, knowledge, and discuss the Gnostics, Knights Templar, and leading this into or up to Freemasonry, Rosicrucians, and we get Graham's take on the fruits of these societies and secret societies. We talk about the destiny of America, the New Atlantis, the intention of the founding fathers of the USA. We discuss sacred cities, sacred faith, and how Egyptian civilization seemed to have been supplanted around the world with alignments of monuments and buildings to stars in the heavens. 